members. The content of the following program, including all statements from the hosts and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by the host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship. And the material from this program shall not be viewed as substitute for a personal consultation with an attorney. Now, prepare yourself to be informed and entertained by Gus Bravo and Neil Kotze, two AV-rated trial lawyers who have been practicing law for a combined total of nearly 40 years. For the next 30 minutes, they will share their insight and commentary on important legal issues affecting all of us. Gus, do you, <laughs> do you know what the difference between lawyers and vultures are? No. Well, I can guess, but I, I, I suspect that this part of the show requires me to say, no, Neil, what is the difference? <laughs> Removable wingtips. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked that joke. I don't know why. <laughs> Welcome to Attorney Confidential with <laughs> Gus and Neil. Well, we are really going to the bottom of the barrel <laughs> now, right? Barrel. Um, well, thank you, well, Neil, for that Well, that's because I asked permission to tell a joke that involves certain aspects of um, sexual relationships and was told those phrases wouldn't work on the air. So maybe we'll come up with a cleaner version of that joke by the next show where I can figure out how to say it more cleanly. Here's hoping. Well, thank you for <laughs> yeah, uh, tuning in to Attorney Confidential with if Gus and Neil. If that's not an incentive to listen to next week's show, I don't know what is. Well, um, last week we, we talked about something a little bit was somber, obviously, the, right. the, the Paris, the terrorist attacks, and, 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 and obviously this, the issue is still going forward. I think this week probably want to maybe switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about things that are a little bit more charitable, if you will, um, because there, even though there's a lot of negative in the world, there's also a lot of positive. And so we've had some shows where we call them the shameless plug self-serving show. <laughs> this is going to be kind of a quasi shameless plug self-serving show because I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough is the pro bono work that lawyers do and, and and for the record it's not when a client stiffs you with the bill that you can then call it pro bono <laughs> well okay you can but that's not the type of pro bono work i think we're talking about correct and, and i think i think it's 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 important to to highlight that because we're members of the community and and there's a lot of and not just lawyers obviously there's a l every profession a, does a, lot a lot of, of good. doctors do a lot of work that they don't charge for for people that can't afford medicine in fact doctors that are traveling to haiti and doctors other countries, without borders that right. gets us into a political discussion that we want to avoid right exactly. because of the anyways but but i thought we can devote this show or this segment or or whatever long we can talk um, um however long we can talk <laughs> well, yeah, that's we true. can talk for that's a long true. time that's but, true. but we can talk about uh, some just you know pro bono work, uh, some right. of our own uh, uh, cases that we've handled that we're proud of. That, that it's not necessarily something that has um, obviously it's pro bono, so it doesn't generate any type of economic uh, benefit, but it has something much more meaningful. Uh, and I know that you especially have something that I think you're very proud of as far as some of the pro bono work that you've done. Right, and before we get to that, I mean, I, as we talk about pro bono work as lawyers, I think we have to, we will do a shameless plug for someone other than ourselves is the legal services organizations we have in Florida. Yes. And a lot of people don't recognize that uh, different municipalities have their own legal services organizations. Some counties in Florida have them. And then there's the state of Florida has what's called Florida Legal Services, which does incredibly important work throughout the state. They are one of the most underfunded organizations in our profession. Uh, so the shameless plug I give to any lawyers who may be listening, or even if you're not a lawyer, they are constantly in need of support, uh, financial support. Or your time. Right, or time. Right. If you're a lawyer, I mean... You can co-counsel with them on cases. And the cases that, that, that I'll talk about for me is it, it, are, I was done, were done in conjunction with Legal Services of Greater Miami and Florida Legal Services because they needed trial lawyers to help them in cases because they don't have the staff. And their staff is already overwhelmed with the amount of work they get. They have to turn away cases sometimes because they're so underfunded and so overwhelmed. Because lawyers, obviously, it's it's an expensive proposition to, right. to hire a lawyer. Uh, and un it's unfortunate. And so what well, most people assume, because most of their experience, whether it's on television or maybe personal, is that they're, you know, with criminal you do have a public defender. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney right, part of your Miranda rights, one will be provided for you. 
that's not the case in civil <laughs> and right. so and so in civil uh it's it's if you cannot afford a lawyer you obviously you're gonna have to fly solo in fact if you're a company you have to get a lawyer uh but but that's a whole different issue but there's so many people that are in need of attorneys and sometimes the the issue is is financially even if you have the money it doesn't justify paying a lawyer to you know however many thousands of dollars when you maybe you're fighting about ten thousand dollars right it, it just financially just doesn't make sense and for some people ten thousand dollars is a lot of money i mean for a lot i shouldn't say I mean, for a lot of people ten thousand dollars is yes. a lot of money yes but uh typically it's difficult to get a lawyer on a ten thousand dollar case for a couple of reasons one the going rate for a skilled litigation lawyer, even of the most junior nature, is what would you say? I guess two hundred dollars an hour would be really low. That's very low. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think if I know somebody that would be skilled enough to try a case. I mean, uh, you have big firms charging that much for a paralegal, right? Uh, certainly, <laughs> exactly. So, certainly in the hundreds for paralegals. So if you do the math, um, if a lawyer is used to, to charging two hundred dollars an hour, uh, it only takes. Uh, you know, f- fifth, what's that? Fifty hours uh, to get to the ten thousand dollar recovery, which is not a lot of work. Um, uh, because yeah, in, in litigation, that's that's no. probably halfway there. Right, right? F- fifty hours. I mean, you take four or five hours to draft the complaint, then you've got to take a deposition and all the discovery. I mean, there's no way to get all the way to a trial for fifty hours. I don't care how simplistic the case is. So that's one reason why it's hard to get to a trial um, with and, and so if you go by the standard contingency rates lawyers who charge 30 40 percent recovery well if you only stand as a client to gain ten thousand meaning the maximum recovery the lawyer can make is four thousand and they're used to getting paid two hundred dollars an hour when they bill their clients now you're talking if they spend more than twenty yeah, I don't hours. Two hundred dollars an hour. Lawyer no, I mean that's. You're I, find, I don't either. I, I don't think you're going to find. It's usually insurance, defense, number. contract work. But yeah, you exactly. Look, look I mean, finding a lawyer for that. I mean, look. I mean, we, we we joke. I, I think lawyers the rates are ridiculous. But I mean, I've been practicing law now twenty five years, and when I was at Carlton Fields, I mean, if I were Carlton Fields today, my rate would be close to six hundred dollars an hour. Now I, I am worth it, but that's his whole. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to well, it. Yeah, I know. You beat it's, me to it. Uh, but but, but it, it's it's you know it's funny because I I sometimes a lot of times I put myself in the in the shoes of of the client and I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of money because I know I complain when I go to the dentist or a doctor and I got to pay this and then I realize, well, I'm asking clients to pay four or five times that and every profession has its, its own value, but with lawyers, remember the only thing we have to offer is our time. And so, whereas a doctor may see in one day a hundred patients, right? Uh, and so, it may be on, they're only paying fifty, but it's a hundred of them. No. For us, there's there's a there's a limit, there's a cap. We can only work so many hours in a day. Of course, I think you had the joke uh, many many months ago about Are someone the, who's according to your time. <laughs> <entries>. <laughs> you must be one hundred and three years exactly. old. Exactly. But so there's only right. so much that we can we can give the devote to a time so when we're not working on this file we're not making money in that file right i i, I remember as a young lawyer I, I won't mention the name or the firm that had a policy that they would uh if you had to travel for a client you would bill them minimal uh minimum nine hour day because the theory was you're taking me out of the office uh i can't do work for other clients and uh it's just a nine hour day if i've got to go on a trip for you right. it's a minimum it could be more than that if you actually spend more than that, but it's a right. nine-hour minimum. Well, there was a lawyer I knew that would travel to D.C. to cover uh, issues at the labor board for four or five different clients and bill each of them nine hours a day. <laughs> and they actually had to reconfigure <laughs> the billing system because it wouldn't accept anything more than 24 hours in a day. Figure. And so when he's writing down a 45-hour day, the billing system would reject it as the, being a typo. One is the Gregorian ca- calendar. So, <laughs> the other really calendar. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so look, those are the bad examples. Those are the bad we're going to about the charitable let's examples. Talk about that we went the down the good. wrong path. Lewis <laughs> but, and Clark, let's right. get back on on path here. Right. Uh, why don't you tell us about your your? Uh, I, I know you've done a lot of good pro bono work over the years, but I know there's one particular case I think is near and dear to your heart. Right. I, and we may have talked about this on a prior show, uh, but uh, and no, I don't forget it. Then, then we'll move on to the next. Oh, one. We'll move on to the next. <laughs> one. And I know that our good friend Jeff Van Trees, who's on Tuesdays at six o'clock, uh, I was on. In fact, that's how I, we were first introduced to the radio. Is I was one of Jeff Van Trees' guests. 
Well, I, I okay, heard April radio the show. before that. Well, I mean, I'm a little bit more tech I'm, savvy than you. Apparently. I knew radio existed. <laughs> I just finished my first introduction to being on radio, and, and that's how you and I got this show started yeah. was with Jeff Van Trees. But uh, in 2012, I was, was very fortunate to be approached by Florida Legal Services and Legal Services of Greater Miami, two organizations I mentioned earlier, who wanted to pursue a case on behalf of autistic children in the state of Florida. And uh, what was going on was there's a treatment, if for anybody who's listening who has an autistic child or, or friends who are autistic, there's what we use is what's called applied behavior analysis or ABA to treat children with autism. It's behavioral therapy, behavioral modification, and it helps them develop and, and get past some of the issues that they have to deal with. Well, insurance companies in Florida and in many states in the country, thanks to the people at Autism Speaks and their lobby, have, have mandated this coverage in private insurance. But Medicaid wasn't paying for it. And the reason Medicaid in Florida wasn't paying for it was because they were claiming it was an experimental treatment, even though it had been around for 50 years. And so we decided to file a lawsuit against Florida Medicaid so that the children, because if you think about children on Medicaid are, are, are really in need of medical care a lot more than a lot of other children because they have no money, their parents have no money to pay for medical care. And if you don't provide behavioral therapy to an autistic child, you're really... Does it make that big of a difference? It does. I mean, you're, you're looking at the ability of that child to develop into a productive member of society versus, unfortunately, the lack of providing care could lead that child to be someone that has to be institutionalized for the rest of their life. And that's not... Every child's not the same. That's right. just... Those are the ex so extremes. So that type of therapy is proven to be very effective. Yeah, absolutely. And so we, we took the state to trial and, and we're able, after a four-day trial... we? Myself, Miriam Harmatz, Monica Vigbaton, and... Um, um, Betsy, oh God, and those folks name, are but, with. Uh, they were all with Florida Legal Services, and Legal Services of Greater Miami did it in conjunction with one another. Betsy Havens, I knew I was going to remember the name. And we tried the case in front of Judge Judge Joan Lennard in Miami in uh, doo -doo -doo, October, November, two thousand twelve, and we're able to get a, a, ver a verdict in our favor. And now every child on Medicaid who has autism in the state of Florida is getting this benefit. And, and what is I like about that case and why it's near and dear to my heart is it got me involved with the autistic community. I've gone to now two Autism Speaks legal conventions. And what I've learned is that was the first state in the country uh, where that case was tried. Oh, now really? the dominoes are falling all over the country. Right. So not only did we benefit an estimated uh, eight, eight, nine thousand 9,000 children in Florida every year, but we may have benefited hundreds right. of thousands of children around the country who now are getting this benefit because of the Florida opinion. And, so. and the, the impact in their lives is, right. is in, in amazing. I mean, I, I think, I, I know I have friends that whose, whose kids are autistic and, and, and they talk about how, how important this, this treatment is, this, this type of therapy mm -hmm. that they get. And, and like you were saying, the unfortunate thing is the kids who are on Medicaid tend to be obviously, by definition, going to be lower economic uh, families that can't afford a, a lot of basic treatment. And so those kids are going to be really neglected. And, and so they're, they're already, they already have certain disadvantages compared to other autistic kids, right, who come from wealthier families. So, so to put them even further behind. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, and again, we ultimately want to lead them to a path of where they can make more meaningful contributions to society and, and, and for themselves and, and, and obviously... Well, the, the the thing, autism is not a condition that can be cured, but it is a condition that can be treated. Right. And if you don't allow the treatment, you, you are really, you're really depriving that child and their family of, of a lot of, of, of that child's ability to develop and grow and become a productive member of society. I mean, it's really akin to denying someone with cancer chemotherapy hmm. because you're it's a the only known proven treatment to help them improve and if you deny them that then you've denied them the chance to survive in many ways but i mean and again that's the extreme i mean without it are there chil could children still develop sure now, how I mean, did you get involved in the case well it was the second case i tried for them the earlier case i'd done pro bono was um it was the denial of uh let's see gabapentin or neurontin the uh, state of Florida was denying prescription medication when it was prescribed off-label throughout the state. And for those of you that may not know what off-label is, a lot of drugs, gabapentin, I'll use that as an example because that's what this case was about. It's gabapentin, or you may know it as Neurontin, is an anti-seizure medication. 
It, I forget who makes it, maybe Pfizer, I think it's Pfizer. Uh, and when you have medication that's prescribed for a particular use, what doctors over time learn about that drug is it has other benefits. Uh, for example, what we've learned in medicine is that gabapentin actually helps people with neuropathic or nerve pain, if you, especially diabetics. If you're diabetic and you have serious nerve pain in your legs or fingertips, for whatever reason, gabapentin is a drug that actually minimizes that to the point where you don't even feel it. No one has developed a prescription medication for neuropathic pain. It doesn't exist yet. But we have gabapentin, which is described off-label. Florida said gabapentin is an anti-seizure medication. Medicaid is not going to pay when it's prescribed for anything other than seizures. Even though neurologists throughout the country prescribe gabapentin to people when they have nerve pain. And it is approved. No one rejects it. Florida rejected it because they claimed it hadn't been proven. Same analysis. Experimental. Experimental. And so uh, I was involved in that case, and that's how I got to meet the people, legal services, and uh, they called on me for this next case. And and I was actually the irony of this is when um, you there came the time to actually be rewarded for the fruits of your labor. Obviously, the reward was in, right. in being able to get this victory, and, and I'm sure that the, the hundreds and thousands of families that may know or may not know, you know, when, when, right. when that you know that this started, but they had a, a, a ceremony or, or awards banquet at the, the Daily Business Review that they have every year in right. Miami. And so uh, you couldn't make it. So yours truly yeah, got right. to go in your place. And so I got a lot of pats on the back that day from people thinking that I'm, I'm, you know, one Neil Kotze. Uh But you know, I tried in my fact, best. I was the reason I couldn't make it was because I was working with a client trying to get medical services for some autistic right. children, and I wasn't going to cancel that meeting to go to an awards banquet. So, but yeah, thank you for going no, on my and, behalf. And, and I think, look, this is one of those. Um, you know, it's it's interesting the practice of law. You you never know, right? Where 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 you're going to leave your legacy, uh, and it's ironic in your case because you defended the tobacco industry. For well, I mean, and that, that you know, that, <laughs> the, the, the interesting story about that is that I would not have been able to win either of those two cases. And, and Gus, you asked me why, how I got involved in those. Well, it was because of my background trying complex scientific issues on behalf of the tobacco industry that when legal services came to Carl Fields asking if there was a lawyer who could develop a case against the uh, denial of a pharmaceutical medication, that Carl Fields said, well, we've got Neil, maybe he'd be interested. And a lot of the skill set I learned in defending the tobacco industry is the same skill set that actually helped me with these pro bono cases. In fact, in my closing argument to Judge Leonard in the autism case... You said Leonard or Leonard? You know, I, I, I've heard her pronounce it Leonard, actually. I, sometimes I say Leonard because that's how it's... It's spelled L-E-N-A-R-D, but I, I think it, she actually does pronounce it Leonard. But uh, what I, in my closing argument, I actually said to the judge that the scientific analysis being used by the state to deny coverage for this treatment is exactly the same scientific analysis the tobacco industry used in the 80s to deny that smoking causes lung cancer. And by the way, Judge, I do know a little bit about this. <laughs> and she looked at me and she knew who I was and my right. background and, and, and it gained some credibility with her sure. because she knew I knew science. I knew how to present science in the courtroom. And uh, in some ways, I think when you start comparing a defendant to you know big tobacco, no one likes that defendant. <laughs> And here it was the state of Florida who really was misinterpreting scientific literature the same way the industry had been doing it. Well, uh, listen, I think that's uh, great. And I think that's one of those things that I was saying earlier. Um, you re really never know where you're going to end up and, and what case is going to become something uh, that, that, that you're proud of. And, 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 and so often, I think, uh, we, we work on cases. Yeah, listen, we got to pay the bills. We got to keep the lights on. Uh, and 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 just a, a basic thank you from clients. Oh yeah, you know it it, it goes a long way. Well, there's a saying, and, and you know, we've talked about this on a few shows. Um, I'm very active in Rotary, which Rotary is a, one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world, whose motto is service above self. But there's a there's a phrase I've always liked using is that to the world you are just one person, but to one person you can be their world. And when you look at cases like this, and it's not just us. I mean, there are lawyers all over the world oh, yeah. that do work like that. I mean, Gus, I mean, you had a great pub well, pro bono case. Well, eventually I'll get to field. talk about mine. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and we should talk about yours. Philly buster in the, uh, yeah. the whole thing. Well, it's funny. We had the same judge. 
Jack oh, Leonard. Leonard, yeah. So uh, it, my my story is is is, is um, it's a federal case. I was actually also at Carlton Fields, but it, it's funny. You never know how things are going to start. Mine wasn't because I had some vast experience in, in 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 tobacco industry or the science or stuff like that. It was just a partner comes knocking on my door and says, "Ask me the following question." You speak Spanish, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Is that Ben? <laughs> We're not going to name names, okay? And so, I didn't say the last name. <laughs> and so I said, yes, I do. Okay, great. You're on this case. And so what ended up happening was um, there's a, a, a nonprofit called the Center for Justice and Accountability, a- another group that does great, great work. And, and they, they spun off from Amnesty International. They, at one point, this was a group that was just like part of the legal team of Amnesty International. Yeah. So their focus has been on going after and, and, and prosecuting uh, people who are accused of human rights violations. And, and so there are a lot of these, particularly from Central America and South America, from the Americas, if you will, uh, particularly from the 70s and the 80s when there were a lot of anti, let's call it communist type of movements but it would morphed into keeping the status quo and anti-leftist type of things right. around, around Contra and all those things, particularly in Central America, that the U.S. government was funding a lot of these uh, right-wing governments to try to, you know, uh, basically eradicate any type of left-wing movement. So naturally, what happened was a lot of these military people got a heavy hand. They actually had a school here in, in, in Georgia right outside Atlanta, called the School of the Americas. So it was a military school where they trained a lot of these high-ranking personnel on how to torture people. And, and it, Really? Yes, yes, your government, Neil. I say your government. Why are you saying my government? <laughs> well, listen, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's near and dear to my heart because I'm from Chile. And so we had a dictator, Pinochet, that, that a lot of these types of techniques, it, it's not just simply that they were torturing people. It's not the numbers. It's the way they were doing it. They would they would gr- go into the homes and and pull people out in the middle of the night, right? And so and then they would disappear, and it's to try to pu- impose a certain type of fear, right? Intimidation on on the population, and that that's where a lot of their tactics, a lot of the things like the water border and stuff. This is stuff that's been, been been done for for ages. Right. So anyways, long story short, in Honduras at, in the eighties, obviously there was the leftist movement that the government was trying to get rid of. And so the military was going around and really we fighting actually, against We have that in this country, too, where it's a leftist uh, movement. We're trying to get rid <laughs> of let's but, not, Let's okay. not go there. <laughs> okay. So what ended up happening was there was a college professor um, who was, I mean, politically involved, but he was a college professor. And let's just say his politics, being a college professor, were a little bit to the left, you know? And so one night, but he was not involved in any type of you know, guerrilla movement, any type of, you know, armed stuff. But it just so happened in his block, there was a group of, of guerrillas, I guess, that were setting up shop. So one night, in the middle of the night, the military comes and literally blocks off the whole block. And they pull everyone from that block out. And they come into his home, college professor, per- fairly affluent background, wife, kids, and they, they take him away. So they took him in one direction, they took his wife in the other direction, took the kids in a third direction. And, and what ended up happening there, he was taken to a, like one of these houses outside the city, tortured for a week. His wife was the same thing. I mean, horrible. By the, the kids? S- the kids were not tortured. The kids were then uh, uh, given to other family members. Um, wow. And so, yeah. I mean, horrible, horrible things that honestly, it's, it's, it's probably not even worth talking to on the radio, but... But it just, just suffice to say they were just the, the, the worst type of nightmare. Uh, and so eventually the condition was the government said, we'll obviously let you go, but you can never return to this country again. And so the, the, the colonel, there was a colonel that was involved in this. He was kind of like the part of the, the secret service type of things. The, 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 the leader of the, of the mob squad, if you put. he's the one that said never return, took their passports, and put him on a plane and shipped him off to, flew him off to the U.S. Fifteen years later, then they set up shop in D.C. Of course, the, 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 the husband, he's a journalist, he starts a, a, a newspaper among Hondurans there and everything. And eventually he builds up enough of a reputation where he is receiving an award for some kind of community service from, from, from the, you know, the, the, the Honduran 
you know, delegates or Honduran embassy. So he's there, and, you know, that night, and, and he's being introduced to different people, and sure enough, he meets the colonel that had been responsible for his torture 15, 20 years earlier. And the colonel had no idea, obviously. There have been so many people right. that he had tortured. He had no idea, but obviously this, the husband could never forget. And so he, then he started doing some investigating and whatnot and he realized that there's this group called Center for Justice and Accountability that actually brings lawsuits against those people here. Because what happens is a lot of those folks are actually those generals of military people retire here in the U.S. Because not surprisingly, after they're retired, there's a lot of people back home that do not like them. So they come here to the safe haven of the U.S. Well, we, I didn't know this until I started working on the case. There are a couple of federal acts that are actually allow the U.S. government or allows a private citizen here to sue for crimes against humanity committed outside the U.S. And it gives you subject matter jurisdiction. Not to get too technical, but obviously the person being here, they have personal jurisdiction over them. The question was, can we prosecute someone for crimes committed outside the U.S.? The answer is yes. There are some federal, there's a Federal Tort Claims Act, and there's also an anti-piracy and slave trading, trading act that's written broad enough to cover that because it was meant for, you know, uh, obviously, obviously making piracy and slave trading illegal. Well, it's not just simply you can't come to our borders with that. It was on the high seas. Long story short, we ended up bringing a lawsuit against the, the colonel and it was in front of Judge Leonard. And um, look, he, he didn't put up much of a defense. Eventually he got deported. So we ended up having the trial without him there. You say, wow, well, of course you won. Yes, of course you won. But what was powerful about the case was that these people got to go into a federal courtroom in the United States to tell their story. And Judge Leonard took the time. She, obviously, she was going to give us the, the, we ended up getting a verdict for $47 million. Well, not going to collect. Know, but and never going to collect. But, but I think we have two minutes. Yeah, I was going to say. But, I don't want but yeah, but Judge Leonard had a prepared speech. Because she understood the significance of this, and what she said, and she and she dictated her speech at the at the husband and wife, because they both got up there and had the courage to talk about what had happened to them, mm -hmm. and she said, you know, I know that it's been years that you can finally tell your story and finally have someone in some type of government capacity tell you, we're sorry, yeah, that this happened to you, and and there were so many tears that and 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 the lawyer who you mentioned earlier who had tried a lot of cases said, you know what. That was among one of the most powerful moments in a courtroom because it was cathartic for the, the, the husband and wife. They had been carrying this burden so long. And I could see it firsthand just to be able to say it in open court and have someone say, we believe you and we're sorry. It doesn't matter of a penny, 47 cents, not 47 about the money at that It's point. not about the money. And, and these people were so appreciative of that. And listen, I got to take some, so ask some questions, get participate in the, the, in the trial. I was very involved in working it up, and we ended up getting an award from the firm for that, and it got some, you know, publicity. But right. but to me, the powerful thing was how cathartic a, a courtroom can be uh, for folks that have endured this type of atrocities. And and I'll, and I'll never leave me that feeling that of, of release that those the, that couple yeah, had. Yeah, no, there's nothing more rewarding. So like it that. looks like, look, we're coming at the end. Of, yep. of, of our show, um, I have the final words of wisdom. Um, it's the seven lovely logics, okay? One, make peace with your past so it doesn't spoil your present. Two, what others think of you is none of your business. <laughs> Three, time heals almost everything. Give the time some time. Four, no one is the reason of your happiness except you yourself. Five, don't compare your life with others. You have no idea what their journey is all about. Six, stop thinking too much. It's all right not to know all the answers. You know, I think that applies for you. <laughs> and last, <laughs> smile. You don't own all the problems in the world. Fair enough. And with that, thank you again for uh, tuning in to Attorney Confidential with Gus and Neil. And see you again next week. Good evening. Listening to Attorney Confidential with Gus Bravo and Neil Kotze. Two rated AV trial attorneys with over 40 years of experience. Tune in next week for another episode of entertainment, insight, and just plain fun. That's Monday, 6 p.m. on WNN. 
1470 AM. See you next Monday for more Attorney Confidential. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors.